Sketches by Boz, Section Forty One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. Sketches by Boz by Charles Dickens, Section Forty One. Characters, Chapter Nine. The Dancing Academy. Of all the dancing academies that ever were established, there never was one more popular in its immediate vicinity than Signor Belsmethi's of the King's Theatre. It was not in Spring Gardens, or Newman Street, or Berners Street, or Gower Street, or Charlotte Street, or Percy Street, or any other of the numerous streets which have been devoted time out of mind to professional people, dispensaries, and boarding-houses. It was not in the West End at all. It rather approximated the eastern portion of London, being situated in the populous and improving neighbourhood of Gray's Inn Lane. It was not a dear dancing academy. Four and sixpence a quarter is decidedly cheap upon the whole. It was very select, the number of pupils being strictly limited to seventy-five, and a quarter's payment in advance being rigidly exacted. There was public tuition and private tuition, an assembly room and a parlour. Signor Belsmethi's family were always thrown in with the parlour, and included in parlour price, that is to say, a private pupil had Signor Belsmethi's parlour to dance in, and Signor Belsmethi's family to dance with, and when he had been sufficiently broken in in the parlour, he began to run in couples in the assembly room. Such was the dancing academy of Signor Belsmethi's. When Mr. Augustus Cooper of Fetter Lane first saw an unstamped advertisement walking leisurely down Holborn Hill, announcing to the world that Signor Belsmethi of the King's Theatre intended opening for the season with a grand ball. Now Mr. Augustus Cooper was in the oil and colour line, just of age, with a little money, a little business, and a little mother, who, having managed her husband and his business in his lifetime, took to managing her son and his business after his decease, and so, somehow or other, he had been cooped up in the little back parlour behind the shop on weekdays, and in a little deal-box without a lid, called by courtesy a pew, at Bethel Chapel on Sundays and had seen no more of the world than if he had been an infant all his days, whereas young White, at the gas-fitters over the way, three years younger than him, had been flaring away like Winken, going to the theatre, supping at harmonic meetings, eating oysters by the barrel, drinking stout by the gallon, even out all night and coming home as cool in the morning as if nothing had happened. So Mr. Augustus Cooper made up his mind that he would not stand it any longer, and had that very morning expressed to his mother a firm determination to be blowed in the event of his not being instantly provided with a street-door key. As he was walking down Holborn Hill, thinking about all these things, and wondering how he could manage to get introduced into genteel society for the first time, when his eyes rested on Signor Belsmethi's announcement, which it immediately struck him was just the very thing he wanted, for he should not only be able to select a genteel circle of acquaintance at once, out of the five-and-seventy pupils at four-and-sixpence a quarter, but should qualify himself at the same time to go through a hornpipe in private society with perfect ease to himself and great delight to his friends. So he stopped the unstamped advertisement, an animated sandwich composed of a boy between two boards, and having procured a very small card with the signor's address indented thereon, walked straight at once to the signor's house. And very fast he walked too, for fear the list should be filled up, and the five-and-seventy completed before he got there. The signor was at home, and, what was still more gratifying, he was an Englishman, such a nice man, and so polite. The list was not full, but it was a most extraordinary circumstance that there was just one vacancy, and even that one would have been filled up that very morning, only Signor Billsmethy was dissatisfied with the reference, and being very much afraid that the lady wasn't select, wouldn't take her. "'And very much delighted I am, Mr. Cooper,' said Signor Billsmethy, "'that I did not take her. I can assure you, Mr. Cooper, I don't say it to flatter you, for I know you are above it, that I consider myself extremely fortunate in having a gentleman of your manners and appearance, sir.' "'I am very glad of it, too, sir,' said Augustus Cooper. "'And I hope we shall be better acquainted, sir,' said Signor Belsmethy. "'And I'm sure I hope we shall, too, sir,' responded Augustus Cooper. Just then the door opened, and in came a young lady, with her hair curled in a crop all over her head, and her shoes tied in sandals all over her ankles. 
"'Don't run away, my dear,' said Signor Belsmithy, for the young lady didn't know Mr. Cooper was there when she ran in, and was going to run out again in her modesty, all in confusion-like. "'Don't run away, my dear,' said Signor Belsmithy. "'This is Mr. Cooper, Mr. Cooper of Fetter Lane. Mr. Cooper, my daughter, sir, Miss Belsmithy, sir, who I hope will have the pleasure of dancing many a quadrille, minuet, gavotte, country dance, fandango, double hornpipe, and Farina Hoka Jingo with you, sir. She dances them all, sir, and so shall you, sir, before you're a quarter old, sir. And Signor Belsmithy slapped Mr. Augustus Cooper on the back as if he had known him a dozen years, so friendly. And Mr. Cooper bowed to the young lady, and the young lady curtsied to him. And Signor Belsmithy said they were as handsome a pair as ever he'd wish to see. Upon which the young lady exclaimed, Law, pa! and blushed as red as Mr. Cooper himself. You might have thought they were both standing under a red lamp at a chemist's shop. And before Mr. Cooper went away it was settled that he should join the family circle that very night, taking them just as they were, no ceremony nor nonsense of that kind, and learn his positions in order that he might lose no time and be able to come out at the forthcoming ball. Well, Mr. Augustus Cooper, went away to one of the cheap shoemaker shops in Holborn, where gentlemen's dress-pumps are seven and sixpence, and men strong walking just nothing at all, and bought a pair of the regular seven and sixpenny long-quartered town-maids in which he astonished himself quite as much as his mother, and sallied forth to Signor Belsmithy's. There were four other private pupils in the parlour, two ladies and two gentlemen, such nice people, not a bit of pride about them. One of the ladies in particular, who was training for a columbine, was remarkably affable, and she and Miss Billsmithy took such an interest in Mr. Augustus Cooper, and joked and smiled and looked so bewitching, that he got quite at home and learnt his steps in no time. After the practising was over, Signor Billsmithy and Miss Billsmithy and Master Billsmithy and a young lady, and the two ladies and the two gentlemen, danced a quadrille. None of your slipping and sliding about, but regular warm work, flying into corners and diving among chairs, and shooting out at the door, something like dancing. Signor Belsmithy, in particular, notwithstanding his having a little fiddle to play all the time, was out on the landing every figure, and Master Belsmithy, when everybody else was breathless, danced a hornpipe with a cane in his hand and a cheese plate on his head, to the unqualified admiration of the whole company. Then Signor Belsmithy insisted, as they were so happy that they should all stay to supper, and proposed sending Master Belsmithy for the beer and spirits, whereupon the two gentlemen swore, strike em well good if they'd stand that, and were just going to quarrel who should pay for it, when Mr. Augustus Cooper said he would, if they'd have the kindness to allow him, and they had the kindness to allow him, and Master Belsmithy brought a beer in a can, and the rum in a quart-pot. They had a regular night of it, and Miss Billsmithy squeezed Mr. Augustus Cooper's hand under the table, and Mr. Augustus Cooper returned the squeeze, and returned home too at something to six o'clock in the morning, when he was put to bed by main force by the apprentice, after repeatedly expressing an uncontrollable desire to pitch his revered parent out of the second-floor window, and to throttle the apprentice with his own neck-handkerchief. Weeks had worn on, and the seven-and-sixpenny town-maids had nearly worn out, when the night arrived for the grand dress ball, at which the whole of the five-and-seventy pupils were to meet together for the first time that season, and to take out some portion of their respective four-and-sixpences in lamp-oil and fiddlers. Mr. Augustus Cooper had ordered a new coat for the occasion, a two-pound tenor from Turnstile. It was his first appearance in public, and after a grand Sicilian shawl dance by fourteen young ladies in character, he was about to open the quadrille department with Miss Belsmithy herself, with whom she had become quite intimate since his first introduction. It was a night. Everything was admirably arranged. The sandwich boy took the hats and bonnets at the street door. There was a turn-up bedstead in the back parlour, on which Miss Belsmithy made tea and coffee for such of the gentlemen as chose to pay for it, and such of the ladies as the gentlemen treated, red port, wine, negus, and lemonade, were handed round at eighteen pence a head and in pursuance of a previous engagement with the public-house at the corner of the street, an extra pot-boy was laid on for the occasion. In short, nothing could exceed the arrangements except the company. Such ladies, such pink silk stockings, such artificial flowers, such a number of cabs. No sooner had one cab sat down with a couple of ladies, than another cab drove up and sat down another couple of ladies, and they all knew, not only one another, but the majority of the gentlemen into the bargain, 
which made it all as pleasant and lively as could be. Signor Bell Smithy, in black tights with a large blue bow in his buttonhole, introduced the ladies to such of the gentlemen as were strangers, and the ladies talked away, and laughed they did. It was delightful to see them. As to the shawl dance, it was the most exciting thing that ever was beheld. There was such a whisking and rustling and fanning and getting ladies into a tangle with artificial flowers, and then disentangling them again and as to mr augustus cooper's share in the quadrille he got through it admirably he was missing from his partner now and then certainly and discovered on such occasions to be either dancing with laudable perseverance in another set or sliding about in perspective without any definite object but generally speaking they managed to shove him through the figure until he turned up at the right place be this as it may when he had finished a great many ladies and gentlemen came up and complimented him very much, and said they had never seen a beginner do anything like it before, and Mr. Augustus Cooper was perfectly satisfied with himself and everybody else into the bargain, and stood considerable quantities of spirits and water, negus and compounds, for the use and behoof of two or three dozen very particular friends, selected from the select circle of five-and-seventy pupils. Now, whether it was the strength of the compounds, or the beauty of the ladies, or what not, it did so happen that Mr. Augustus Cooper encouraged rather than repelled the very flattering attentions of a young lady in brown gauze over white calico, who had appeared particularly struck with him from the first. And when the encouragements had been prolonged for some time, Miss Bellsmithy betrayed her spite and jealousy thereat by calling the young lady in brown gauze a creeter which induced the young lady in brown gauze to retort in certain sentences containing a taunt founding on the payment of four and sixpence a quarter which reference mr augustus cooper being then and there in a state of considerable bewilderment expressed his entire concurrence in Miss Bellsmithy then renounced forthwith, began screaming in the loudest key of her voice at the rate of fourteen screams a minute and being unsuccessful in an onslaught on the eyes and face, first of the lady in gauze, and then of Mr. Augustus Cooper, called distractedly on the other three-and-seventy pupils to furnish her with oxalic acid for her own private drinking, and the call not being honoured made another rush at Mr. Cooper, and then had her stay-lace cut and was carried off to bed. Mr. Augustus Cooper, not being remarkable for quickness of apprehension, was at a loss to understand what all this meant, until Signor Bellsmithy explained it in a most satisfactory manner by stating to the pupils that Mr. Augustus Cooper had made and confirmed divers promises of marriage to his daughter on divers occasions, and had now basely deserted her, on which the indignation of the pupils became universal and as several chivalrous gentlemen inquired rather pressingly of mr augustus cooper whether he required anything for his own use or in other words whether he wanted anything for himself he deemed it prudent to make a precipitate retreat and the upshot of the matter was that a lawyer's letter came next day and an action was commenced next week and that mr augustus cooper after walking twice to the serpentine for the purpose of drowning himself and coming twice back without doing it made a confidant of his mother, who compromised the matter with twenty pounds from the till, which made twenty pounds four shillings and sixpence paid to Signor Bellsmithy, exclusive of treats and pumps. And Mr. Augustus Cooper went back and lived with his mother, and there he lives to this day, and as he has lost his ambition for society, and never goes into the world, he will never see this account of himself, and will never be any the wiser. End of section 41